to uh, 1 John chapter 3. If you're in the early service this morning, I thought Brother Johnny was going to preach my sermon. And so uh, he did a wonderful job. He sure did. And it was a blessing to be here, <clears throat> be here this morning. It sure was. What I want to show you today, just real quick, and we probably won't be long. Um, I want to show you this uh, uh, amazing hope that we have in Christ. The amazing hope that we have in Christ. And I'm going to just go through the first six verses. So that's all we're going to do. We're not going to read the whole chapter or anything like that. Just the first six verses. And I'm going to try to, uh, I'm going to, try to hurry along and not get bogged down in some of the details and chase too many rabbits. Uh, and so what I want to show you today is that, you know, there's a lot of things that are going on. But we have a hope in Christ that surpasses all others. If you've been born again... If the spirit of the Lord is living inside of you, if you if you have uh, this new heart that's described for us uh, in the pages of Scripture all the way from the beginning to the end that God said he would do in his people. If that's you and you have this new heart, then uh, uh, I know that uh, this hope lies in you. And no matter what happens in this life, no matter what happens, no matter what trials or circumstances you go through, no matter what things go on in your family, in your finances, your relationships, there's coming a day when everything's going to be made right. There's coming a day when all the crooked places in your life are going to be straight. And uh, so what I want to do is I want to take just two things I want to show you in these first six verses. I may read a little past that, but we're only going to expound on the first six. I want to show you the, the nuts and bolts of what this hope is that we have in Christ. I want to explain it to you. I want to let John explain it to you as we look at first John. And then I want to show you the evidence that you have this hope in Christ. Do you know that uh, there's a lot of things that we uh, that we enjoy, a lot of things we say we love, but uh, there's always evidence of it in, in your life. It's always evidence. In, and I'll just give you a, I'll give you a quick few examples of that. Let me just read the first six verses and then we'll go back and then we'll uh, we'll look at those. It says, behold, what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when when he shall appear, we will be like him for we shall see him as he is. And then here's the evidence. That's the hope. This is the evidence. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Talking about Jesus is pure. Verse four. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law for sin is transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifest to take away our sins and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. It's kind of scary verses, aren't they? We're going to explain those. We're going to, we're going to show you what he's talking about there. And yeah, it's supposed to be a little scary. And so what I want you to see, first of all, before we even get into any of that, I want you to, I want to talk about the hope that we have in Christ, the, the blessing that it is to be saved. You know, when you talk about, I get to meet a lot of people throughout the week. I get to meet a lot of preachers, get to meet a lot of uh, other church members from other churches, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of people all over the all over the area. And, and of course, we, you, we've said this before and you know this, that uh, that there's a problem today it's a, it's a worldwide problem. But is there's even a problem here in our own community, our own section of the country. It's that the gospel is nothing more than the baby steps. You've heard me say that a million times. That happens to be one of my little pet peeves when somebody has the thinking that, you know what? Well, I've heard this story about Jesus. I've heard the cross. I've heard the old, old story. I know all about he, yes, right. He went to the cross and, and he died on the cross and he was buried in the tomb. He was raised again. I got that. That's Christianity 101. That's the baby steps. Now you need to give me more of the meat. You need to give me more of the, the, the serious things of God. I want to get deeper into those things. Nothing. It's like, it's like grading a spoon over a cheese grater is nothing gets me more riled up than when someone speaks like that or talks like that, because the gospel is not only how you get into this relationship with God. It's not only how you come to know God as your Lord and Savior and he saves you and changes you and transforms you into his child, but it's also how you live day to day as a Christian. It's also how you walk this out. The same 
faith that, that you had when you came to know Christ is the faith that you live by as you go day in, day out in this life. The same repentance that you had when you came to know Christ for the very first time is the same repentance that characterizes your life day in and day out. That's the new heart that God gives you. And what I want you to see is it says, behold, what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us in verse one that we should be called the sons of God. Now, when I say the father loves you, when I say God loves you immediately, it's going to be, yeah, we've heard that. I know it. God loves us. He loves us and he loves us so much. And he loves us in spite of all we do. And in spite of all the things we are, I got that. If that's how you're thinking, then you probably don't understand this love that God has for you. Because the more you think about how much God loves you, and I'm not talking about when I say you, I don't mean all y'all as we do in the, in the South here. I'm talking about you personally. I'm talking about you. You sit right there in the green chair that you're sitting in. God loves you. Whatever your name is, wherever you were born, however old you are, whoever your parents was, God loves you. What manner of love has he had for you that you should be called his son or his daughter, his child? What manner of love does he have? He loves you. Now, you know how amazing that is? That's amazing. And if it's not that amazing, if you're thinking, yeah, I, I'm pretty much knew that. I pretty much knew God loves. The problem is that you don't understand the seriousness of what sin is and what sin has done in your life, in my life, in our lives. Today, sin is nothing more than, whoops, I made a mistake. I stubbed my toe. I did something wrong. Well, come on now. Now, you know, all have fallen short of the glory of God. Who, have you ever used that as an excuse did you know that was absolutely not what Paul meant when he wrote that? We, when someone's confronted with a sin or someone comes and says, you know what, that right there, you probably shouldn't be doing that. That's a sin. God says that's a sin. Well, what's the excuse we give? Well, now all have fallen short of the glory of God. As if that, as if that somehow makes it better. You and I, we're not going to stand. I, I love all y'all, but y'all not going to stand with me at the judgment. It's not going to be me and all my friends and all my neighbors. So me saying, you know what? I'm, I'm not that bad a guy. I'm a pretty good guy. And, you know, compared to all the rest of y'all, I'm really good. You know, compared to all, I don't know what y'all got going on. But compared to y'all, I'm pretty good. It, it, it's not going to matter because I'm not going to be standing with all y'all. It's going to be my dark heart alone standing before God. I'm not going to have a bunch of other dark hearts to hide behind. I'm not going to have another bunch of people around me going, well, at least I ain't the worst one in the bunch. It's going to be me all by myself. And if I didn't attain God's standard of perfection, then I'm going to have to answer for that. I'm going to have to answer for that. And I'm going to have to give it account for every Bible says for every idle word that I've said. So understand that sin is not just whoops, I made a mistake. Sin is cosmic treason. It's rebellion against God. When my heart says, you know what? I know God says that that's wrong, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. I know God says, you know what? I know God says I need to be fellowshipping with my brethren, but you know what? I'm tired. When God says, you know what? I know I shouldn't be watching that thing on the TV. What, what if, we all got it. Whatever it is that's your sin, you pick it out. God says, I don't want you to do this, or I do want you to do that. And we say, you know what? I don't feel like it. That's not, oops, I made a mistake. That's treason. That's rebellion. You and I are not the victims of sin. We're the criminals. We're the perpetrators. I've said this before. So some of y'all that have been here before, you probably have heard me say this before. But if God were to strike us dead, the moment that we sin, you know what the wages of sin is? It's death. So the very first time that I ever sinned in my life, I deserve death. And God would have been righteous to strike me dead. He would have been good if I, if, if. Lightning melted me as I stood right here. You would all probably say, well, some of you at least would say, ooh, that was a bad thing to happen. Some of you would probably be shouting, but <laughs> you would all be like, ah. but all creation would be saying, go get him, God. You did good because you and I are evil. The Bible says it over and over again. Every thought, intentions of our hearts, evil all the time. Genesis 6. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart's desperately wicked. Romans, Paul says, in my flesh, there is nothing good. That's what he says. I know that in my flesh, there is nothing 
good. So this idea, this idea about, well, I'm not so bad. You know, I, I help folks. I'm a good person. I do good things. I, I'm not as bad as that guy down the road. I mean, whoo, he's going to have a time when he gets to the judgment. I'm not that bad. This idea about I, I'm better than most people. It's a lie. It's a lie for you. And it's a lie for me as well. I, I once heard the story about this, this old preacher. He, uh, the, the old lady came up to him and she said, brother, so-and-so, please pray for me because I'm a horrible sinner. He said, yes, ma'am. I'll pray hard for you because I know you're a very bad sinner. And she said, well, I ain't that bad. <laughs> we don't have a problem saying for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we have a problem looking at our own heart and saying, you know what? I'm an evil person. I'm a wicked person. I'm a wicked, wicked person. Now, when I say that, you know, why I'm saying it over and over again, because I can tell when it's hitting, it's bouncing back going, oh, I'm not that I mean, now. I ain't that bad. Yeah, you are. And I am, too. Think about it. I could run through the Ten Commandments and just I mean, I wasn't planning on going this far into it, but but I, I can feel it bouncing back at me. I mean, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, or thou shalt have no other gods before me. Have you broken that one? Okay, that's one. Uh, don't have any graven images. Now, I know ain't none of y'all going home and cutting something out of wood and bowing down to it. But we have all kind of little idols in our lives, don't we? That's two. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand and say if you ever commit adultery. Please don't raise your hand. This is not one of them kind of church services. Brother had to come back and say, Jason, what did you do, man? Why I got 14,000 messages on my machine. But Jesus said, Jesus said, if you look at another with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. That's three. It says, thou shalt not steal. You ever taken anything? I'm talking about in your whole life now. I'm not talking about last week. I'm not talking about from starting right now. I'm talking about your whole life. You ever stole anything? Okay, that's four. In first John, the book we're reading says, if you hate another person in your heart, that's murder. That's five. That's five of the Ten Commandments. I could keep going, but we'll stop right there. So out of the Ten Commandments God gave, you already broke five of them. If I went through the next five, you'd have done broke them too. So do you still think you're a good person? When you stand before God, think about this for a moment. If you only sinned, and that's not all sin is, is just breaking the Ten Commandments. Sin is when God says, I want you to do something and you don't do it. He who knows to do is what's right and doesn't do it to him. That's sin. Every time God says, I want you to be a witness to that guy. And you say, ah, I'm tired right now. Sin. Every time you don't love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Sin. If you sin three times a day and you only lived for, let's say, 50 years. Most everybody will live past that. But let's just say 50 years. I ain't good at math. So somebody else figured it out. At 365 days, you sin three times a day for 50 years. That's a lot of sin. Amen. That's a lot of law breaking. If you stood in front of a judge and you said, judge, I'm a really good person. I deserve to be let off. And he said, well, let me look at your record. Uh, according to this, you've broken 457,000 laws. Now, what's the judge going to say? Is he going to say, yeah, you probably are a good person. No, not even close. So I want you to understand all that is really bad news. And y'all are looking at me like, wow, thanks for coming to church today. Yay. <laughs> all that is awful news. And it's, it is bad news. And it's true. All of it's true. I have told you no lie. I can prove it from scripture. If you, if you'd like me to see me after church. But what's amazing is that while in the midst of all of this sin, all of this rebellion, all of this wickedness, all of this hatred to God that you and I live in. He loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. He sent his son to die for you to pay. So when you stand before that judge that we're talking about and the judge looks down and says, "Woo, you done broke 487,000 whatever laws. What makes you think? That punishment for all those laws has been put on another, on the son, on Jesus. And he took it and he paid for it so that I and you could go free if we trust him. So behold, what manner of love 
What manner of love is this? Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. God is, I mean, it's even more than that. God is your creator. He made you. He made you. He put his breath in you. And he's not like a watchmaker. He didn't just wind everything up and then turn it loose. And now you're just going off doing, you know, your thing and the world's just turning. He's actively involved in keeping you alive. In Colossians, it says that in him, all things hold together. If it were not for him holding things together, everything in you would split apart. We'd have to have a lot of paint in here because, oh, never mind. That's a bad joke. Anyway, all things hold together. And so every breath you take, he's given you. Every heartbeat, every heartbeat that beats in your body and something doesn't go wrong is a gift from God. Every time that you spend a day, yeah. Every time that this machine that is your body, which is amazing in itself, uh, it doesn't have something that throws a gasket or something in it. It's because of God's mercy that he has been with you and watched over you and took care of you. It only takes. Yeah. As a person who works at the hospital, you know, you nurses probably know more about it than I do. But as a person who works, when they when you hear at the hospital, code blue room, whatever, I have to go. That's where I'm at. And I get to watch all that goes on. And so understand that I'm uh, every day. I mean, it doesn't take but it doesn't take but the, the head of that pin right there to stop up one of your blood vessels and you dead. You gone. And it happens in 30 year olds just like it happens in 80 year olds. So the fact that everything is functioning right, everything's going good, my heart's beating, I'm able to talk, I'm able to enjoy Dairy Queen when we leave here, whatever, that's a gift of God. He created you, he created you, and he can pull that breath back anytime he gets ready. And so he created you and he has the right to say, I want you to do this. I want you to go here, I want you to obey this, I want you... He has the right to do so because if it weren't for him, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be breathing. You wouldn't be anywhere. He has the right. And so when we kick sand in his face and say, "Eh, I don't feel like it. It's not just, oops, I did something wrong. It's I will not have you rule over me. Who do you think you are? We're sitting in God's lap, as it were, in order to slap him in the face. And we're saying, you know what? I'm not going to do what you say. I don't care. I'm going to live how I want to live and I'm going to do what I want to do. It's just like this is really bad analogy. But you folks that are old enough to have kids or or you children who are have parents. I'm assuming we all have parents. uh, You get. Yeah, that was a joke. You're okay. Um, If you paid for everything, room, board, food, whatever. I would feel like, hey, they, you kind of owe me something. You know what I mean? When I say, uh, I've said it to my kids, maybe I'm just a bad parent, but as long as you live in my house, you're going to do what I tell you to do. If I say stand on your head in the corner, get you a pillow and put it in the corner because you're going to be there a while. <laughs> God has given us everything. And he, he, he has the right, the ownership rights over us. And he can do what he wants when he wants. He can command us. And when we say no, it's rebellion. It's almost like, it's almost like, think of it this way. Let's do this and then we'll move on. It's like a king who's ruling on his throne and here come all of his servants that he's given food and health and prosperity to, and they rebel against him and want to throw him off his throne. And in the midst of doing this, they storm the castle and they set fire to everything and everything's burning and the king escapes. He's out. And then all the people who are rebellious and, and have done what they wanted to do are inside. And now they're caught in the fire that they started their self after they were pillaging and destroying and stealing and trying to throw this king off the throne. And instead of the king saying, you know what? Just let them burn. He says, I'm going to send my son in to go get them. I'm going to send my son in and he's going to give his life so that they can be saved. What manner of love is this? 
that the Father has bestowed upon us that sinners, us, who have broken his command every day, constantly, we could be called the sons of God, the daughters of God, the children of God. He gave his son that we could be the children of God. That's the hope that we have. Now, look what it says. It says, and the world, it says, therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Yeah, it's offensive. It's going to be offensive every time we talk about it. Did you feel now be honest, just honest one time. You ain't got to raise your hand, but just be honest. When I started talking about how bad we are and how you've never done anything good in your life, as far as righteousness before God, you might've done a lot of good things, but as far as earning righteousness before God, you've never done anything good. You've never done, you, you don't have one check mark by your name in the book of God outside of Jesus Christ. You have nothing. When I started saying there's no one righteous, no one does good. Romans 3, no one understands, no one seeks for God. When I start talking like that, there's something in there, maybe way down deep that says, oh, hey, you talking about me. Come on, be honest. There's something in there that fights against that. Like, who? I mean, I'm not that bad. Come on now. That's, a, that's an offensive message. And when the world hears it, who do you think you're talking to? I'm not, no, I'm not no sinner. I mean, we all have sin, but I'm not as bad as Joe down the road or whoever. I hope ain't none of y'all named Joe. I'm not as bad as all them guys. But it's an offensive message. We don't want to be that bad. We don't want to be sinful. We don't want to be wretched. We don't want to need salvation. But we most certainly do. So moving on, verse two, I want to show you one more thing about this hope that we have. Then we'll do the evidence and then we'll leave. It says, behold, now are we the sons of God? It says right now, if you've accepted Christ as your savior, if Christ has accepted you as his child, if you are his and your life belongs to him, he owns the ownership rights to you. If you have given him your heart, trusted him, if you have been made a new creation and your heart longs for God, desires God, are you making a hundred today? No, of course you're not. I'm not either. But does your heart desire to serve him, desire to love him, not just desire to have things from him, but desire him? It says, then you are son of God. You are a daughter of God. You are a child of of God. He has made you his child. And he did that because if you desire him, he put that desire in you. You sure didn't have it on your own. And I didn't either. If you have that desire, he's put it in you. Now, at this moment, as you're sitting here, if that's your heart's desire, you're a child of God. And it says we have such a hope that we're waiting for. It says, look, and, uh, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Now, two things and then we'll move on. I'm going to try to get done so we can get home. But we're going to be like him. Do you realize what a hope that is that we have in him? It's two things. Let me show you. Number one, eternal life is going to be real life forever. That means I'm going to be me forever. You're going to be you forever. I'm not going to lose none of my memories. I'm not going to lose my personality in eternity. You know, I get to deal with people who have uh, or or on their, you know, that are not going to get up out of the hospital bed ever. You know, that's going to be where they sit for the rest of their life, however long it may be. And we get to talk about eternity, get to pull out the Bible and see what the Bible says about this. We are going to be who we are forever. We're going to be alive forever. Jesus, when he returned from the dead, when he was raised on the third day, he came in and he ate with his disciples. And he said, look, you touch the nail prints in my hand. You touch the spear uh, hole in my side. He said, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So we know that, look, when we don't know yet what will be, but we know that when he shall appear, we'll be like him. We're going to be like him. I'm going to be me forever and you're going to be you forever. Whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell, you're going to be you forever. You're going to know the things you know here. You're going to know there. The people that you know here, you're going to know there. I can prove that from scripture. When Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, who appeared next to him? Moses and Elijah. And guess what? They had been dead for 800 years and they were still Moses and Elijah. 
They were still who they were. You're going to be who you are. I'm going to eternal life really means eternal life. What a hope is that? That I'm going to go on living forever. If I want to drive my four wheeler down to the crystal sea and stay for a thousand years, that's what I'm going to do. And it'll be, it'll be, it'll be wonderful. I'll be able to touch you and you'll be able to touch me. We'll be able to have conversation. We'll be able to have life. It'll be real. I don't want to be some spirit floating around in the clouds somewhere. I don't want to be out in, in space somewhere doing whatever that is. I want to be me and I'm going to be me because God created me to live forever and he created you to live forever. So we don't know what we're going to be, but we know that when he appears, when he comes for this second time in glory, we're going to be like him. And he was who he was in reality. He had a real body, wasn't the same body. He could go in and out. He could come and go, but it was him. He said, you touch it, you feel it. It's going to be life. It's going to be real life. But the second thing is even greater than that. We're going to be like him. We're not going to have any more sin. Now, let me ask you, be honest. It's in church. You know, God killed two people for lying in church once before. <laughs> Y'all going to be studying Acts in Sunday school. Today. You'll, hear, you'll, you'll hear about it. <laughs> be honest. When I said we won't have any sin, did that hit you as exciting as it was to have eternal life? Do you know why it either did or it didn't? Because if your heart is made new and if you're saved by the blood of the lamb, the one thing in this world that you hate more than anything is sin. I tell this story all the time. I used to, I used to do body work. Oh, I mean, that's what I did for a living. I played music, did body work. And uh, I wasn't very good at, well, anyway, uh, I would, and every day, it was three years before I got saved, I knew that the answers that I was seeking were in that Bible. Lost is, lost is anything. I didn't, I would, if I, I would have busted hell wide open most of my life. But I knew that the answers for what I was feeling, I was empty inside. Nothing made me happy. No purpose. No nothing. I knew the answers were in that Bible. So this is going to be about the year. It's about 1999. Every day I would go to work and I'd worked at the body shop in Covington and I'd go to work and at lunch I would read my Bible every day and I would pray lost as lost can be. But I knew the answer was in there. So I kept on and on and on and on. I was saved in 2002, 2003. Right in there. The next day. And did I mention I had a filthy mouth? I know y'all can't picture that, but I had a filthy mouth. Watch it now. Be careful. (laughs) The next day after I was saved, I went back to work, still working at the body shop. I was laying up under, I was laying up under a Ford truck and I was turning wrenches just like I'd always done. And the wrench slipped. Happens all the time. I'm sure you mechanics have felt it before. My knuckles scraped across the frame of that truck. And I said something that no Christian should ever say. The difference between that day and the day before was my heart broke. And it was like, how could you? It's not even been 24 hours since God saved your soul. And here you are. Sinning against him. That's the difference between a saved heart and a lost one. It's not that it's not that bad things aren't able to come out of my mouth. I could I could do them with the best of them. The difference is now that it hurts because my heart has been changed. Not because I'm better. I'm not no better. If I were to, if it's not possible, but if it were possible for the Holy Spirit to leave and and all this to go, I would to go back to the way I was. I would be. I'd, I'd run right off back to everything that I used to be if it were not for the Holy Spirit inside me, were not for the new heart. So it says, it says, uh, we're going to be like him. Now, if your heart doesn't get excited over the fact that you won't have to fight against sin no more, something bad wrong. Something's bad wrong. If you get excited over the fact that I'm going to have a real body and I'm going to be alive forever and I'm never going to die and there's no sickness. And those are things we should get excited about. I'm glad. I mean, it's real exciting to me. 
But if something in your heart doesn't get excited about the fact that, hey, I won't have any sin anymore. I won't have any fight against sin anymore. That's pretty exciting. We don't know yet what we're going to be. But we know that when he appears, we're going to be like him. That's the hope that we have. Now, let's look at the evidence and then we'll go. This is not a blind faith. If you're a Christian, there's evidence in your life. Not because you're such a great guy, not because you're such a great gal, but because God keeps his word. He promised that he would give you a new heart. He would cause you to keep his commandments. He would put a new spirit inside of you and that he would be the one working in you. And I've got news for you. If he's not working in you, listen to me. If he's not working in you, then one of two things is a reality. Either you're not a Christian I don't care what you prayed or how many aisles you walked down or how many baptistries you went through. Either you're not a Christian or God's not trustworthy. One of those two things has to be true if God is not working in you as his child. Now he says, look at verse 3. He says, every man that has this hope. It says just the preachers that have this hope, right? Just the Sunday school teachers, just the really, really, really committed Christians that have this hope. Every man, every person, that means every body that has this hope does what? Purifies himself. Notice it doesn't say you purify yourself in order so you can get the hope. Make sure you understand that. Y'all, if you're saved, you got the hope. It's yours. But it says, if you have this hope, every man that has this hope, it's your possession. It's a reality in your heart. Every man that has this hope is going to be purifying himself. Even as he is pure, he is going to be moving and striving to be more like Jesus, the man or the woman, the boy or the girl who walks around and says, yes, I'm a Christian just because, uh, you know, I believe that there was a Jesus and he died on a cross and rose again. But there's no evidence in my life. I do exactly what I want to do when I want to do it. I'm not talking about going out bank robbing and, and wearing black earrings in your nose or whatever. I'm not talking about sacrificing goats and doing all those things. I'm not talking about that guy. I'm talking about the guy and the lady who get up and go to work every day and come home, and feed their family, get up and go to work every day. I'm talking about that guy, the one who says, you know what? I'm just going to do what I want to do. And I know what God says, but you know what? I'm going to watch exactly what I want to watch on TV. I'm going to go have fun with the world as exactly as much as I want to. I'm going to look like the world, act like the world, live like the world. I'm going to drink the world down like water. And oh yeah, I'm going to go to church on Sunday. That person is not a believer. I don't care who you are. I don't care who you prayed with. I don't care what aisle you walk down. I don't care how many times you've been dunked in the baptistry. God says that he will change your heart to you so you will serve him. Now, does that mean that I'm saying in order to be a Christian, you got to be perfect? Well, I hope not, because if that's true, then ain't none. No, I'm not saying that you don't sin. I'm not saying you don't that you don't break God's law. I'm not saying you got everything going on. I'm not saying you do everything right. I'm not saying you go a single day without sinning. But what I'm saying is your heart desires God. Your heart desires to love him, to serve him. And you hate sin. He says, every man that has this hope purifies, purifies himself. In fact, if you have any questions, go home and read first John. It's only five chapters. First John is a book that is written so that you will know that you have eternal life. It's all about evidence. Let's look at the evidence. First John is that book. Go home and read the whole book. It's it's uh, it's instructive. Now, what does purify mean? What am I talking about when I say purify? Let's read three more verses. We'll go home. It says, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Remember, we went through the law, Ten Commandments. For sin is the transgression of the law, and you know that he was manifest to take away our sin. That's why Jesus came. And in him is no sin. And here's the conclusion. Whosoever abideth in him, that's the saved folks, by the way. Jesus said, abide in me and I'll abide in you. The Father will come and sup with you. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now, there's something that you need to know here. 
I'll spare you the intricate Greek lesson, but in Greek, the present tense is a continuous activity. It's an ongoing lifestyle. It is over and over and over. It's not talking about if I take a Polaroid and catch you in a sin, that means you're not a Christian. What it's talking about is if I take a a camera and give you the whole movie of your life and you live a habitual lifestyle of sin, then you're not a Christian. Christians can sin with the best of them. Christians can do some awful sins. But a Christian cannot live in sin and God not chastise or discipline him. It's impossible. And it's impossible not because Christians are better than anybody. We've got the same wicked heart that everybody else has. It's impossible because God keeps his word. And if you don't believe that God said, when God said, I'll give you a new heart and I will cause you to keep my commandments. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. I'll give you a new heart and you will love me and follow me and seek after me. If you don't believe that God will do what he's promised there, you ain't got no reason to believe John three sixteen either. Because God's going to keep every single one of his promises. So when it says that, it's talking about, look, who, whoever abides in me. He doesn't continue in sin. He doesn't live a lifestyle of practicing sin. He doesn't revel in sin. Why? Because sin hurts. You know what it means to abide in him? It's, uh, it's five people live at my house. They abide at my house. Me, my wife, my three kids. Now, all y'all are more than welcome to come over, but y'all ain't staying the night at my house. <laughs> Why? Because y'all don't live there. At the end of the night, it's time for y'all to go home. It's time for you to go back to where you live. But the four people besides myself that live there, that's where they live. They call that home. They come and go as they please. They're free to make it their home. They're free to stay there. They're free to reside under that roof as long as they see fit. That's what it means to abide in Christ. That's where I live. That's my home. That's, I am a son, your daughter, son, daughter, child of God. We are called to abide with him. That's our residence is with him. And if our residence is with him, it can't be with anybody else. If I, let me tell you, I had a little deal with, where's Jacob? Is Jacob in here? No, he's in there good. I'm going to talk about him. Y'all don't tell him. That boy... Should I tell you? I'm going to tell you just because it make you laugh. And then, that, that boy just got his little hardship license. He's fixing to go, you know, he's be 16 in three months. So he, he goes to school in Crockett. And so that's where he plays baseball. So he got a hardship license so he can turn. We, we, I'm going to edit this out of the camera then. That boy took a Snapchat of himself going 100 miles an hour in my truck. I don't know whether to be mad because he's going 100 miles an hour or that he was stupid enough to take a picture of it. Yeah. And so my phone, you know, all all y'all, I don't do the Snapchat. I I got it, but I don't really know how to use it too well. So I started getting phone calls. Hey, you know what your son doing? Uh, I don't know. But you know what happened, right? When he got home, you know where his truck is? It's in the front yard. It's going, we're going to be weed eating around that joker before he drives again. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. He abides in my house. And he chose to break my rule. And now he's going to face consequences. I will not let him abide going 100 miles an hour in my truck. If I abide in Christ, I may do something really stupid like that. But God's not going to let me get away with it. He's going to come and discipline me. He's going to say, what do you think you're doing, boy? Are you, are you out your mind? He says, I discipline those that I love. I chastise those that I love. Those that are my children, you may step out there into something. But I'm going to reach out. I'm going to pull you back. 
I'm not going to let you do nothing dangerous. I'm not going to let you go too far before I say, whoa, 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 whoa. Come here, I need to teach you something. Understand that those that abide in Christ, they can't abide in sin. So here's the point, and this is the point of the whole message. We're going to end right here. If you look like the world, act, remember the first verse? The world doesn't know us because it didn't know him. If you look like the world... If you act like the world, if you live like the world, if you're comfortable around the world stuff, if you do the things that the world does and you live that way, you have no evidence whatsoever that you have been born again. The book of 1 John is all about evidence. It said, whosoever says they're in the light and walks in darkness is a liar. Read it. That's what it's there for. Let me read just a few more. I'm not going to preach them. I'm just going to read them to you. In verse seven, it says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Remember, we're talking about habitual over and over again, lifestyle for the devil sinneth from the beginning for this is the purpose For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. He's saying you can't live in it because this is why he came, was to destroy those works. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Lifestyle, remember. For his, this is why he doesn't commit it. Because his seed remains in him and he cannot Sin. He cannot commit sin. He cannot continue the practice of living in sin. Why can he not? Because he's so good and he's so wonderful? No, because he is born of God. Verse 10, last verse. In this, this is how we know the children of God are manifest. This is how we know who the children of God are. And the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. So you understand as they start the invitation music. What we're talking about here. I wanted you to see the good news at the beginning. You have a hope. There is a door set before you that you will live forever. And no more pain. No more suffering, no more dying. All those that have gone before you are there waiting on you. You're going to know them. They're going to know you. You're going to be you forever. Wonderful news. But that's not just a hope that we look for. That's a hope that we can see right now. Because if you are of him, he's given you a new heart. And that new heart longs for him. It desires him. It desires to love him, to serve him, to follow him, to be in relationship with him. It's like it's like teenagers with their little boyfriends and girlfriends, you know, texting until three in the morning. What are you doing? Nothing. What are you doing now? Nothing. What do you what do you want to talk about? I don't know. What do you want to talk about? I don't care. They just want to be with each other. That's a love for God. I just want to be with you. And he said, I just want you to be my child and to be with me. I love you too much to let you go run off in traffic playing. I love you too much to let you go run off in sin. So if you're out in traffic and you're playing and you're enjoying every minute of it, understand, I was a person, I was lost until I was 29, 29. 43 now. I was lost until I was 29, but I was one of those people at 11 years old that came down to the front of a church because I didn't want to go to hell. And I prayed with the preacher. And I got news for you. I, I really believed. I was, I was serious when I was praying as a, at 11 years old. I really didn't want to go to hell. I really believed that there was a Jesus, that he lived and died. I believed that he died on the cross. I believed that he rose again. I, really, I believed that all my life. But I didn't give myself to him. I didn't trust him with my heart. Most of y'all know me that 
I made a living playing music and I did exactly what I wanted to do, where I wanted to do it, when I wanted to do it, as much as I wanted to do it. There was no evidence in me whatsoever that God was working, at work, disciplining me. And to be honest, the scariest thing for me was not the guy at four in the morning on Beale Street. The scariest thing for me was when I decided to give all that up before I got saved, I went back to the church and I sat on the third row of the church for three years. And it never crossed my mind that I might not be saved. Never crossed my mind. I was, it was at another church, a good church. Nothing wrong with the church, nothing wrong with the people, nothing wrong with the preacher at the time. But it never crossed my mind. Can you imagine how many people live today and say, you know what, we're going to, I know we've been off doing our thing for 20 years. We're going to get back in church. That's a wonderful thing to do. But you better make sure that you know that you're saved. Because I could have sat in that pew for the rest of my life. I was working in the church, serving in the church. I was teaching kids how to play guitar and bass and drums, all that. I had a little youth band going at the other church. And I was lost as lost could be. If you looked at me, you would have said, wow, that Jason, he really done turned his life around. He's doing good. I wish my kids would be like him. But I was just as headed to hell on the third row of that row of that church as I was on Beale Street. All hours of the night playing music. It's not only possible, it's probable that most of the people in churches across this land will die and go to hell. Not because they're just exceedingly bad people or because inside they're just going, oh, I'm wicked and I can't wait to get out of here so I can do something horrible because they've never submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. It's simple as that. He paid the price for you. The only thing that he requires for you to do is to repent of your sin and trust in him. It's as simple as that. No strings attached. No hoops you got to jump through. No list of things that you got to start doing in your life. You come just like you are. You repent of your sins just like you are. You trust in him just like you are. And then you let him weed out all the stuff you don't want in there. He says, come to him today. You who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. Father, we love you.